Good morning. Welcome to the Harmony of the Gospels. This is uh, lesson number 29. Lesson number 29. Um, Jesus attends a wedding, okay? Jesus attends a wedding. This is a very significant event. Um, this is the first miracle um, that Jesus performs of turning water into wine. All right? So uh, we're going to be in John chapter 2, John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. All right, so let's say a word of prayer before we get started. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank Thee for this day You've given us. Lord, we thank Thee for this chance that You've given us to teach Your Word. Lord Jesus, we ask You just please open our ears and our, our eyes um, and our understanding so we can comprehend Your Word, Lord. And Lord Jesus, please be with this lesson today. Please be my voice today. Help me, Lord, as I teach. In Your name, amen. All right, so let's read John chapter 2, verse 1 through 11. And the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone, after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. And Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water, and they lift, filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. And the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was. But the servants which drew the water knew. The governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. So, the theme here <clears throat> is doing right and following the will of God are most important in the Christian walk. Doing right, following the will of God are most important in the Christian walk. Jesus is our example, and this can, be, this can be seen in his attendance of the wedding of Cana of Galilee. Oftentimes, <clears throat> this text is read or looked at. Folks want to look directly at the miracle, and they forget to look at why Jesus attended a wedding in Cana of Galilee. Why? Okay. Jesus is the Son of God. He attended a wedding, and oftentimes, wedding festivities during this day and time would last more than a week, would last more than a week. There was much celebration. There was much joy, singing, eating, dancing, and visiting during that time, period of time, whether it was Two days, three days, four days, or a week, okay? All right? So, you have the Son of God at an event like this, all right? It makes you wonder when you see people in our society of today, our society of today, they get all wound up. Um, they get all wound up over religion. Um, and they quote, well, I'm the one serving God here, all right? or I'm following the religious practice, okay? And then they condemn others for not being religious enough, all right? So, but they forget that Jesus was a human as well as he was God, all right? And he had a human look at things, okay, when he lived his life here on earth. And, and religious people forget about this, all right? Completely forget about it. Or maybe 
the religious person in this world today is so religious, so religious, that they look down on others when others don't practice religion as they do, all right? But when they see Jesus as human, Jesus as human did not look down on others, okay? Jesus went to a wedding with sinners. He went to a wedding with his mother and his disciples and his brethren. He went because he loved people, all right? He was a light that would shine in Cana of Galilee. He would bring light to a very dark place at this time frame. And Cana of Galilee was a dark place, all right? There is peace, there is light and joy in Jesus. When you turn and follow him, okay? When you don't follow religion, all right? This region of Galilee had been greatly oppressed under the Roman rule. When Zacharias is praising the Lord after his uh, tongue had been loosed in Luke 1, verses 68 through 79, and when you read down through those verses, you get down to verses 78 and 79, and the last part of 78 states, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. There was darkness, no hope, and a shadow of death across this region of Galilee, the Cana of Galilee. This area had been conquered several times, and there was much persecution, all right? Jesus would give them light. He would give them hope. He would bring joy, okay? He would bring joy. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1, it states, Nevertheless, the dimness shall be such as was in her vexation, when at first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan in Galilee of the nations or populations. Okay, the tribe of Naphtali in northern Israel suffered greatly under the Assyrian conquest of Tilgath Pezer III, who attacked in 734 to 732 BC. This attack is covered in 2 Kings chapter 15 verse 29 and also in verse 16 verses 5 through 9 where Isaiah's statement of did more, the did more, okay, did more grievously afflict, did more, okay, is found in 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 5. So this is what the did more grievously afflict means, okay. So in 2 Kings 17, verse 5, when the king of Assyria came up throughout all the land and besieged it three years, three years, all right? There was <clears throat> a very, this was a very great army um, that came up from Assyria that pillaged the region to besiege the strongly fortified city of Samaria. And what they did all around the region is they took from that region to supply the army. So for three years this happened. So they just destroyed the area. All right. When you read in, in the book of Daniel, <clears throat> chapter 11, you will find uh, the depth of the, the did more grievously afflict, afflict. You'll find the depth of it, okay? So in Daniel chapter 11, when you'll find that the kings in the north, which are the Seleucids, and the kings in the south, which are the Ptolemies, they continuously struggled over this region of what we call the Levant, okay? The whole Levant. It's uh, the whole land of Israel, the whole region, it includes Syria and, and you know, many of the, the nation states we know today in that area. 
all right? But they struggled for many, many years over this whole region, okay? So when we get into Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2, the, it states this, Isaiah states this about this region, because the people truly had no hope in this region, none at all. So this gives light to Jesus going to a wedding in Cana of Galilee. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2, it states this, The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. So you kind of get the idea uh, of just how afflicted the region was, all right? So there would be a special blessing upon the people of Galilee who had experienced such a devastating judgment during the days of Isaiah, okay? This prophecy was fulfilled when Jesus lived and ministered in Galilee, okay? All right, so in verse 1, we're going to take a look at verse 1 now of what we read in John chapter 1. John chapter 2, verse 1. Jesus went to a wedding where a feast could last as long as a week, all right? And the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. So here was Mary. She was helping with the wedding, and she calls her son to attend. So verse 2, and Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. Okay, so they all came to the marriage together. So Jesus was on a mission, on a mission okay, from the Father in heaven to save the world all humankind for their sins. Yet he took the time, he took the time to attend a wedding, to take part in the festivities of the wedding. I do not think that Jesus sat in a corner <laughs> and he scowled the whole time. What were these people doing, you know? Now they're dancing. All right. I don't think he scowled sitting in a corner the whole time. All right? I don't think that happened at all, okay? I don't think he scolded people. What, what are you doing, you know, drinking that wine? What are you doing, all right? I don't think, think he did that, okay? He did not scold people for enjoying themselves at this wedding. I'm sure that Jesus had a great time at this wedding with his disciples and the other guests. And guess what? This is the interesting thing. Jesus sinned not in any way. Amen? All right? So you, when you read Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1 through 12, I'm not going to read the whole thing for sake of time today, all right? In a, in a summation of Ecclesiastes 12, 1 through 12, is this, that we do not know the day or the hour of our death. We don't know, absolutely, all right? If any Christian hasn't read the book of Ecclesiastes, you need to. It's an eye-opener about your life. We don't know the day or the hour of our death. We should also enjoy all of our days under the sun. That all of our works, all of our works, all of our works on earth are vanity. It's our vanity. Anything we do on earth, it's our vanity. Okay, all right. We need to rejoice in our youth as we grow up. And then we, we need to uh, always remember our God and, and fear our God and love him. And to keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of mankind. The whole duty, okay. So there's a time and there's a place for all things that happen while we are alive on this earth. Even now, I'm wondering, why have I got this nasty cold? So, but I've got it, okay? So I've got to work through it, all right? So take the time, Christian, and go to a wedding. Take the time and go to an event of, of, of some nature in your family. Take the time, okay? Take the time, go to a celebration, go to a funeral, okay? Take the time, invest in your life here on earth, all right? Jesus went to the wedding 
<clears throat> as he was called by his mother. So what is a wedding? What is a wedding? So Jesus goes to a wedding. So what is a wedding? All right. People don't look, really look and delve into what is a wedding. I appreciate what Charles Spurgeon stated about what a wedding was. He stated this, that a wedding is the last relic of paradise that is left among us. Pretty interesting statement. The first wedding on earth happened in the Garden of Eden, okay? Between Adam and Eve, with God presiding and blessing the union of a man and woman, God established marriage before the fall of mankind. So the wedding is the last relic of paradise that's left among us. During these days, okay, um, of, of, of this society that we're talking about, okay, that we're, we're preaching on or teaching on today, when a wedding was established, the parents had the responsibility of providing the food and beverage for the feast, all right, which could last as long as a week, all right. So it was a, large, a, prep, a lot of preparation for this wedding. In any wedding, even today, a lot of preparation goes into a wedding, all right? The issue in these days is not the same as those days, the days of, of this society we're talking about. In, in the days of the, the Jewish society, to fail to provide the proper hospital, hospitality it's a very serious offense, very serious offense. So verse three, when the guests wanted more wine, Mary said to Jesus, they have no wine. Mary recognized that there was a serious problem for the family, for the family that was going to provide, okay, this wedding, it's going to be a serious problem for them, all right? So she says, they have no wine. To run out of wine was more than an embarrassment, okay? It broke a strong, unwritten law of hospitality. And Jesus was about to respond to this heartfelt need. So in light of the next verse, Verse, Mary was probably not asking Jesus to do a miracle in light of it. And you may wonder, well, how can you say that? Well, here is why. Here's the why behind it, all right? Mary was simply hoping that her son would help solve this major problem and find some wine, all right? In this society, Women relied on the men to accomplish things, to accomplish things for them, all right? Women were not able or allowed to deal with some situations in the society. So if you remember, based off tradition, Joseph is no longer in the picture here. He is likely past. He's probably dead, okay? All right, so Mary's husband is like we did for quite a few years. I mean, quite a few years. So Mary is probably very used to asking her oldest son for help in certain situations. She probably relied very heavily on him um, after her husband's death to, to help her bring up the family and raise up the family. All right, so in verse 4, so getting all of that in context and thinking about it, and let's take a look at verse 4. Jesus replies to his mother, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. The answer Jesus states to his mother is often difficult to understand and can sometimes be very misconstrued, okay? But it's a very simple statement when you look at it, all right? In the collegiate community, much has been written about these verses where pastors and teachers approach this passage 
trying to understand the statement. After you pray, study the passage, it opens up like a beautiful flower to you, okay? It's a beautiful passage. So when a passage of scripture is difficult to understand, the difficulty comes from the reader, okay? It comes from the reader, not the scripture itself. The scripture is very clear. It's the reader that has difficulty with the passage, all right? <clears throat> the passage of scripture is always right and correct. And if you keep that in your mind, then it's easier to understand, all right? If it's always right and correct. When Mary heard the words from Jesus, she may not have understood what he was saying, but Mary trusted that Jesus would find an answer to the problem of the lack of wine, all right? Those who trust in Jesus and believe that he is the Son of God will run into situations they cannot understand. While going through that difficulty, trusting that he will work it out always for your good, okay? It always comes out for your good as a Christian, all right? So the term woman that Jesus uses at this time is a term of a very respectful address, all right? Jesus addressed his mother at the cross this way as well. When he was giving John the responsibility for his mother, he says, woman, all right? Very respectful term. The term, what have I to do with thee? You have to remember that Mary had a level of responsibility with the wedding, not Jesus, all right? Mary had, um, um, had taken on this responsibility, and um, when uh, the guests had wanted more wine, um, it was her responsibility, all right? But she brings this problem to Jesus, all right? So, so you kind of get the idea of the statement, what have I to do with thee? My Ryrie Bible notes state this, that Jesus was saying that concerns you or maybe someone else, but it's not for me. For the hour for manifesting himself as the Messiah had not yet come. All right. So it was not really his responsibility. John Gill pointed out that Jewish writers state this that since there was a governor or master of the feast, that Jesus may have been saying, I say, who should be concerned but the master of the feast? There's absolutely a master of the feast there, and he's the one that should have been concerned. If Mary had the responsibility in the wedding, then maybe the master of the feast should have taken up the cause to find more wine because it, be, it would have been his problem, all right? If you take a look at other versions, uh, the ancient versions um, of, of the Bible, and you, there's a couple of uh, the uh, versions called it. So one of them is the Ethiopic version of the Bible. The translation is rendered in the sense that the King James Version shows it. What have I with thee? What have I with thee? with reference to responsibility at the feast, at the feast and at the feast alone. Jesus recognized it was not his responsibility at all, all right? In the Persian version or Persaic version of the Bible, it is rendered in the same sense of the King James Version. What business hast thou with me, okay? Why would you ask me this, all right? with reference to the responsibilities where since not Jesus was rejecting any responsibility, but was this business that Jesus needed to even attend to, okay? It wasn't really his responsibility is what he was saying, all right? John Gill points out the statement signifies that as man and a son of hers, he had been subject to her. Okay? He was subject to his mother, and he recognized that. 
in which he had set an example of obedience to his parents always. Yet as God, he had a father in heaven whose business he came to do. And in that, and in his office mediator, she had nothing to do with him, nor was he to be directed by her in the work from the Father in heaven, or to be told, or at least the hint given, when a miracle should be wrought by him in confirmation of his mission. So it was pretty clear, he made it clear, very clear to her where his responsibilities lie, all right? So Jesus adds this to his statement, mine hour is not yet come, which means that it was not proper for him to work miracles as of yet, lest it should provoke his enemies before his time where his public ministry and miracles would go together, moving Jesus toward his hour, his destiny, which he had come and would be the time of his sacrificial death on the cross, okay? Mary had called Jesus to the wedding, and now she brought the problem of the wine to him, all right? Now, Mary takes the reproof from her son and states to the servants, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Okay, all right, Mary knew her son was going to help her, all right. Mary had finally submitted to Jesus. She recognized, okay, all right. Our way, our way is not always the right way, okay, all right. You can't tell God what you want him to do for you, okay. It's always God's will first. It's not your will, okay, all right. So submission to God's plan for our lives is key to following God's will, okay? All right, very key. Sometimes we must slow down and attend a wedding to get an answer or to maybe be refreshed, all right? Jesus took time to attend a wedding. Submission, submission, is one of the hardest things to do in a person's life, to stop and just slow down, all right? Mary recognized that Jesus was more than her human son, but she was still a mother, and mothers tell us what to do. They just do, okay, all right? We bring our problems to Jesus, the Christ of God, okay? We may think we know how we want the problem to be fixed, but Jesus may have a plan outside of our comprehension, which is his plan for our lives, not our plan for our lives. It's his plan, okay? All right? So like Mary, we should submit and allow Jesus to deal with the problem as he sees fit. Jesus knows our beginning and our ending, okay? He knows all things about us. He knows us better than we know ourselves, all right? Verse 6. And there were set out six water pots of stone, which is stated, this is stated, to identify that these vessels were used to hold water, and they were stone. They were not made of earth, shells, skins, bones, or any other substance. They were made of stone for a purpose, okay? These vessels were after the manner of what we call the purifying of the Jews, okay? which means for the ceremonial washing of the hands and feet. These six water pots were there for all the guests to clean themselves, all right? All right, before eating, the Jews would pour water over the hands to remove any bad influences that may have come from touching something throughout the day. So they would always wash their hands before eating. Each of these vessels contained two or three firkins a piece, okay? Where, where the total of all of them would be 20 to 30 gallons, all right? One firkin, one firkin was enough to pour 
for a Hebrew bath. So some of these had two or three firkins, which would be nine to 13 gallons for each container, okay? Nine to 13 gallons for each container, all right? Verse, verses 7 and verse 8. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water. Now, these people likely did not know Jesus, okay? His mother knew him, okay? But, and disciples probably knew him. Or, or maybe some of the guests at the wedding party, but not me. But the mother and disciples actually did. So, the servants didn't know Jesus there, okay? And all the wedding guests probably didn't know Jesus. So I'm sure the servants likely wondered, okay, about the purpose behind the water. I mean, if I was a servant at that time frame and Jesus said, fill these things with water, I'd have wondered, okay, well, I guess we're getting water, okay? So I definitely would have wondered. So when you trust Jesus and submit to his will, you follow his direction. It's just that simple, all right? Verse 8, and they filled them up to the brim. And Jesus saith unto them, Draw out now and bear it to the governor of the feast, and they bear it. Following the leading of Jesus is always the right way, even when it might lead to human embarrassment. So I'm trying to give you an idea. Can you imagine how these servants felt? Okay, we're going to draw out water in cups and take it to the master of the feast. He's, he's going to be drinking water. Okay, all right. So I am sure the servants probably were feeling this way. Can you imagine taking this water as a servant to the governor of the feast? Can you imagine this? All right. This may be what the servants thought. Who knows when the water was turned into wine? We don't know. Okay. Maybe it was in the vessel. Okay. Or maybe it was as it was dipped into the cup or put into the cup, okay? But the servants had to trust Jesus as they bore the water to the governor that it would be wine. Maybe it was the moment it was served to the guest. Who knows, all right? But they had to trust Jesus to bear it to the governor. They had to trust Jesus, all right? Verse nine, when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was. But the servants who drew the water knew. The governor of the feast called the bridegroom. <coughs> Verse 10, and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning of a feast doth set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, then the wine that is of lesser quality is set forth. But when thou hast, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. Verse 11, this begins the signs that Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. In the darkness of Galilee, in the darkness of Galilee, Jesus brought light to a wedding feast. Submission to the will of God provided the answer to a need at a wedding. Submission, when we submit, Christ is always there to provide. Matthew Henry stated, His hour is come when we know not what to do. Delays of mercy are not denials of prayer. Those that expect Christ's favors must observe his orders with ready obedience. Many will say, well, I can go my own way and God will take care of me. When you decide to do your own thing, God will let you do your own thing. He will let you have your way. When you get into trouble, God will let you get into trouble if that's what you want. When you realize you're in trouble, God is always waiting for you to turn back to him. Okay? He's always waiting for you to pick up that light yoke 
okay, and, and wear it because his yoke is easy, okay? It's a very easy burden to bear. So he's always waiting for you. The way of duty is the way to mercy. And Christ's methods must not be objective against, objected against in any way. People today look everywhere for excitement. They look everywhere for entertainment. They look everywhere for meaning, okay, and purpose. They never turn to God, and they continue to destroy their lives, their souls. But one day, but one day, when Jesus says, depart from me, for I never knew you, it will be too late, absolutely too late. Get to know Jesus today. Come to him at the foot of the cross. The creator of the world went to a wedding and a feast to shine a light in the darkness of Cana of Galilee. So take the time, Christian, to shine your light within the darkness of this world and go to a wedding. Amen. Thank you for listening.